Okay. First, I want to read a little bi bio on Barbara. Barbara Arlen is one of our wonderful docents, uh, as you all are, and she approached me, I think about maybe two months ago, wanting to do a presentation on Mary Coulter, so, which we have not had an in-depth presentation on, on, on Coulter. So a little bit of information on Barbara, 35 years of global color sourcing fabrics, product, and textile design. Consulting with the fashion and home furnishing industries has allowed her to constantly expand her expertise. She is now teaching color theory in the art department at Santa Fe Community College and has taught design and color at Española Valley Fiber Arts and Fashion Institute of Technology, Pratt Institute in New York City, EWHA Women's University in Seoul, Korea, and the National Institute of Fashion Technology in New Delhi and New Mumbai, India. She moved to Santa Fe four years ago from New York City and um, her presentation is Mary Elizabeth Jane Coulter, eclectic designer of the Southwest and designers she influenced. So, Barbara. Thank you very much and thank you for coming. Um, I just wanted to start by saying that um, I went to the Heard Museum during Indian Market a few years ago and there was this amazing book in the library that was donated. And it was the original screen prints that Mary Coulter had done. Um, she had done it for La Posada Hotel. And I have part of them in the, uh, the presentation today. Um, the most amazing thing to me about Mary Coulter was that she came from a very um, sort of lower middle class family. Her father was a sewer inspector in St. Paul. And um, she was one of the only people who I will be talking about today who didn't come from some aristocracy or very, very upper middle class type of a situation. And those people became decorators as well. So um, this was uh, painted by Arthur Matthews, who was her teacher at um, the California School of Design, where Mary went when she was, um, her father had passed away, her sister and her mother had no means of income, and she convinced them that she should go to art school in San Francisco and, um, and study art and also architecture. So her mother said, okay, go ahead, and she supported them through her art and architecture for the rest of their lives. So she grew up in St. Paul, and the tuition at uh, uh, the California Art School was $2.50 a month. Um, she came back to St. Paul, and she taught for 15 years at a mechanical arts high school. She taught art and, and mechanical drawing. Um, she didn't start to work permanently for the Harvey Company until 10 years after she had begun working for them as a consultant. Each year, she went back to St. Paul to teach at the same school and also edit um, a newspaper um, column that was in St. Paul. She was finally um, hired. Um, to do the, the hotel in Albuquerque that is unfortunately not there anymore. Um, in 1901, there were only four male, four female owned architectural firms and all of the male architects earned at least 10 times more than the females. Sounds familiar. The thing that's really interesting about Coulter was that she, um, she created themes. This is how people do a lot of different collections. Um, you create a theme and then you, um, then you 
create. <laughs> so you so you create a theme that they do this in fashion and they also do this in home furnishings and you also do it in very various types of art. Um, where you create a theme, it could be a real theme or it could be an imagined theme. Coulter created themes that were imagined the way that she had thought that what she was going to put into her buildings or what she would do for her buildings was um, a representation of things that were creative in her mind. So she, she did that at La Posada. She created a theme of uh, generations of um, a family coming from the Basque region through Mexico so that she could actually choose the furnishings that represented her idea of this kind of um, a hacienda type effect. And um, she also created at La Posada a fake ruin. When you go to La Posada in, in Winslow, there's a ruin that is right next to the entrance of La Posada. And it's, she created a fake type of a ruin so that it would look like it was there forever. She also used um, techniques to create um, sort of like used and old type of furniture. And she also, at uh, the Grand Canyon, used a lot of soot on the, um, uh, the fireplace and lots of cobwebs so that it would look like it was really old. So old and used was part of her sort of aesthetic. So this is, I have two pages of this book uh, that the Herd Museum allowed me to take. Um, these are her screen prints that she used as bed coverings. She wrote extensively about them and kept very, very good records, as you might expect. Um, these were the colors. And these were the coverings that were used for the beds in the rooms at La Posada. She also reserved um, other bed coverings in case they wore out. So she, she had ordered these, and she had other bed coverings in reserve. She was very practical. And these are the other. Um, and these are the other screen prints that she used on bedding. They were very well documented. One of the companies is still around, strangely enough, and that is J.H. Thorpe and Company. On eBay, you could actually get um, really beautiful screen printed linens. Almost everything was screen printed on linen. Um, because that was the fabric of the day, and you would never, and, and it had to be ironed. So I, I assume that they had a really good staff of, um, of people at La Posada ironing. So she had uh, the sauce, she had the number of the fabric and the name, she had the color combination because in every fabric you can do a series of color combinations. And I'll explain that in the next slides. Um, which rooms they were used in, which piece of furniture, in this case it was bedding, and how many rooms and how many in reserve. So this is the screen print factory at Mary Mecco in Helsinki. All of these flatbed screens which are lined up are different colors for certain patterns. And um, screens are done either flatbed with, 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 with two people squeegeeing the color across. And I'll explain it step by step. This is how Mary Coulter ordered her fabrics. So um, this is a diagram of a screen printing machine. It was first done by hand, and now it's done automatically. So the screens go. If it's a five screen design with five colors in it, just like you would buy a print, um, 
it needs to go through five different stations. So this is on top a flatbed screen and on the bottom a rotary screen, which we use today. So this is the, uh, the fabric being prepared. And this is the color being mixed and put into the machine, into each screen. This is the fabric being, it's a Mary Mako fabric, it's being uh, printed, 100% cotton. And then it's, it, it comes off the machine into a cart. It's examined and shipped out. This is one of Mary Coulter's um, dining rooms at, at La Posada. It's now called the turquoise room. This is La Posada in an old picture and La Posada today. All from La, La Posada uh, today. Um, I had gone to La Poblanos in Albuquerque, and they have, I don't know if it's originally from La Fonda, they have a few pieces that were original um, pieces of Mary Coulter. And this was her Mimbris um, dining set that can now be purchased at the tour store downstairs. So she did an enormous amount of work. These are all of the places that she actually worked on, some as an architect and others as a decorator. So I'll give you a little time. She retired in 48 at 79. That was her last um, part of being at La Fonda and redoing um, part of La Fonda. Um, and she died in 58. She had a very, very long life. And she had a lot of friends. And she was a very, very tough boss. but. At that time and where she worked, it was pretty normal to be a tough boss. So here she is. She was very hands-on. And one of the longtime employees of Bright Angel Lodge said, Coulter was a female version of Frank Lloyd Wright. He didn't mean that in a personal way. He just meant it that the way that she expected things to be and her perfectionism was like a Frank Lloyd Wright. She also designed the sketch for Indian Gardens, but it was, was one of the places that was never built. But you can see her sketches are really beautiful. The, this man was her teacher and mentor, Matthews. Um, I, I didn't realize he and his wife uh, designed a lot of mission um, accessories and furniture. I didn't realize that he was so famous because um, one of the things about being from the East Coast is you don't know really too much about the West Coast. And California really had an incredible art scene. These are their pieces. And he was also a painter and like a Renaissance man. But you can see from the La Posada book of screen prints to his work um, that flowers were a very important aspect of decoration. And it's part of the Art Nouveau whole thing. And it's part of the Art Deco thing. But uh, the Mission Furniture had an enormous amount of flowers. And you can say that Mary Coulter's um, fabrics had a lot to do with her teacher's uh, floral concept. So um, she was hired to just do the interior of the hotel in Albuquerque. And she did it with probably a theme in mind. She studied the Native Americans. She was up at Hopi a lot of times. And she really, really knew about the culture. 
So she created this theme. And she was good at sales as well. Um, this is, of course, the beautiful Hopi house and uh, the watchtower that she actually designed as an architect. This is the inside. And a lot of it was painted by Fred Capote, who was a very, very important Hopi artist. So you can see where Harvey got the type of symbolism that he used in a lot of his jewelry and, um, and decoration. Here's Fred Capote, a really good picture of him. And this is the ceiling um, on the circular staircase. It's sort of like a Hopi Klimt. <laughs> Einstein and his wife uh, visiting the Grand Canyon. And then Hermit's Rest. That was another sort of theme and made up sort of folklore story. She was probably a really good storyteller um, about um, an old tale about a recluse who wandered into the canyon room, into the depths, and he found Hermit's Trail. I mean, it's a very, very charming way of doing a building and also the interior. So the giant fireplace is dominating, and she had the soot and the cobwebs put on as soon as it was uh, completed. Um, she loved things that were old and, um, and looked like they were used. And these are some of the Grand Canyon interiors that were original. So you can see that a lot of these um, like the bedroom has the kind of feeling of La Fonda. Um, Bright Angel Lodge with the deer coming right up to the doorstep. And her friend who had designed the Harvey Hotel in Albuquerque was the architect and he had hired Mary Coulter to do the interior. I haven't said a lot about uh, La Fonda. That, that could be for another discussion, because you're all docents at, at La Fonda and know it very, very well. So some of the people that I think that she influenced, because remember, a lot of these people came from very, very wealthy families. That they were society women that's, who really, really went in, into decorating. Um, but a lot of them were society women who worked very, very, very hard, and some of them supported their husbands. Um, but um, they also had this eclectic idea of home decoration and, and decoration. Some of them went on to, besides uh, residential, they also went into commercial decorating. A lot of them designed restaurants, hotels, and other, other types of buildings. So the first one is Elsa DeWolf. She was like an amazing sort of a legend on the East Coast. She began to design interiors. It was a male profession. When I went to the School of Interior Design in New York, which was in the uh, sort of 80s, early 80s, all of the teachers were men. All of them were decorators, and they were all very effete. Like anything that you said or did, they had a terrible fit. <laughs> so Sanford White helped her win a commission for the Colony Club. The Colony Club was a club for women. Her work had a visual unity. Um, she, she probably had a theme, um, but um, her taste was anti-Victorian, and that's what made her so prominent. Because at that time, everything was very heavy, it was very dark, it had no air or light coming in, and she brought it all together. 
So, and she was inspired by a French aesthetic because people on the East Coast were always inspired by Europe. So um, they called her America's first decorator because I don't think they ever got to the West Coast. And Dorothy Draper was somebody who used color in a really fantastic way. I mean, remember, she's 1889 uh, uh, to 1969, very, very early, also Victorian educated. So she has this really avant-garde feeling at this time. So Dorothy Draper, um, they said, was to decorating what Chanel was to fashion. And, and Carlton Varney was a very, very important furniture designer and decorator. She opened the Architectural Clearinghouse in 1925. Um, she redid Hampshire House on Central Park South, which I'm sure all of you now, I mean, have known. And um, the Carlisle, uh, the Fairmont, and the Mark Hopkins, these are all standing today. Um, and she um, was very much a trendsetter, and she had a brilliant sense of color. And that's really very apparent in these kinds of small rooms that I've shown. So I mean, would you ever do this? I mean, it's quite wild. <laughs> and, and Benjamin Moore, uh, just a few years ago, came out with her colors. So, and Sister Parrish, um, she, uh, her husband and her father lost their uh, 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 fortune during the Depression. So she just went out, opened up um, a rented room, and hung out her plaque and said that she was a decorator. She had no prior experience except she was a society person, and she obviously had taste, and very, very, very good connections. So eventually, she, um, she and Albert Hadley, who was also a teacher at the uh, School of Interior Design, um, would use a lot of chintz flowers again, um, needlepoint, crochet. The thing that all of these people had in common was they used the best craftspeople. They always used craft. They had texture. And they had a real sense of uh, diversity in their, their types of rooms. So her, her main claim to fame, even though she had worked for Jacqueline Kennedy before uh, Kennedy became president, um, she was able to also redecorate the White House. And that was a very, very long uh, procedure. So she started with a $35 a month room that she had rented. Diane Reland. Diana Reland was um, a very um, sort of, I wouldn't say out of control, but she was somebody who mixed everything up. Everything was eclectic. She worked with the best photographers. She worked with the best editors. She worked with the best um, writers. When she was at Vogue and Harper's Bazaar, and she was the darling of this whole kind of a circle. But she had really exquisite eclectic taste. And, um, and she put everything together, very much like um, Mary Coulter did within um, a sort of um, a Spanish, Mexican, um, Western theme, because Mary Coulter was decorating in a totally different landscape. So anyway, Diana Reland loved the color red. She said that it was the new black. She loved India. She loved all of these exotic places. And in her spread, she used all of these places um, as a backdrop to her fashion. I worked with her um, as a volunteer at the Costume Institute at the Met. We were all volunteers. 
We didn't wear gloves. We didn't do anything. We, we put, it was like astonishing. But instead of doing everything within the boundaries of time, we just put everything together. So all of her um, exhibits at the Costume Institute at that time were all higgly niggly, different eras put together because she loved to put everything together and be very, very exotic. So she too used texture, color, light as, as part of her theme. And we all know Iris. Uh, there was a great documentary about her. She's on the scene every single day in New York. She even has a person who is always with her and always introducing her. She's, she's a really wonderful creative woman. Um, and she founded um, a company that I used to buy fabrics from with her husband called Old World Weavers. They would go to, if you've seen the documentary, they would go to most countries in the world, uh, commission things from artisans, have them woven, and they would have like one of a kind yardage or no yardage for um, any, any decorator who wanted to buy it. It's still in existence, but of course it doesn't have the cachet that they had. And you just can't do that anymore on their scale. So she would put theme boards together, and this is a theme board. She does it today for her own wardrobe. She has massive storage places everywhere um, because she has been collecting for almost 100 years. She probably started when she was one. <laughs> anyway, she has a really amazing collection of these theme boards, and she dresses from the theme boards, and she does her interiors from the theme boards. And this would be, if Mary Coulter had a theme board, it would be something like this, but with a different tradition. And the last person who I'm going to talk about is uh, Kelly, who lives in LA. So it gives you the milieu of where she really, really comes from. Um, she is somebody who has done hotels, she books. Almost all of these people have done lifestyle books within the last 20 years. Um, the only way that you're known, and if you're a chef as well, is, is to do a book. And so Kelly has come out with, I mean, she has a really great website. She, she does books, and she also does hotels, restaurants, everything. But she also has a really wonderful sense of color and a sense of scale because, and texture. So um, just to go through a few of her, um, her, her place is, this is um, a, a dining room table that she has done. I think it's in her house. Her house is like her um, sort of a showroom. And um, you can see by what's on the walls and what's, bless you, and what's, and what's hanging, how, how the scale really uh, predominates a very sort of a serene restaurant, but with lots of textures. So in the course of 30 years, um, Mary Elizabeth Jane Coulter completed 21 landmark hotels and lodges. Five of these are preserved as national historic landmarks and operated by the Grand Canyon National Park. The rustic style she created, later defined architecture for the future lodges and also for many, many other places that are in the West. Thank you very much.